this is um, uh, one of our ISS conflict briefings. It's a series of events we do. There is uh, usually one at, at every month. And in each of these events, we explore one conflict um, that is covered as part of our armed conflict database, which is an online uh, project that covers um, a number of conflicts following political, military, and humanitarian trends. Um, and my name is Antonio Sampaio. I work at the Conflict Security and Development Program under which this armed conflict database and, 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 and the briefings uh, take place. Uh, just a reminder that this event is, um, is on the record and is being live streamed. Um, so as a conflict briefing, this, uh, this event obviously explores usually the political factors and context affecting uh, security, military, and balance of power in each conflict. And in the case of Sudan, obviously, this is quite a political context uh, to explore following the ouster um, in April of uh, President Omar al-Bashir following three decades in power. So we will explore these trends uh, with the help of our uh, analysts here. Uh, starting with uh, no, none other than the editor of the Armed Conflict Database, uh, Dr. Andrew Chi. Um, he uh, focuses on monitoring armed conflict trends globally uh, as part of his position at the um, ACD. And he has previously worked at the United Nations mission, mission in South Sudan, the UN Development Program, and the Commonwealth Secretariat. And Nina Pouls, he is an assistant research analyst here at the Conflict Security Development Program, where she focuses on monitoring and analyzing political, humanitarian, and military developments in East Africa. So, Nina, if I can start with you, um, as, I, as I mentioned, this is quite a political context uh, and good timing for us uh, for this event. Uh, <laughs> Can you provide us a brief description, uh, guide us through the, the political and protest developments that have been happening in Sudan based on, on the, um, the data that we, we have at the ECD? Yes, thank you very much for your introduction. Following months of continuous protest in Sudan, President <coughs> Omar al-Bashir had been ousted of power on 11 April 2019. However, throughout all of 2018, we have seen protests in Sudan against the increase in prices of basic commodities such as wheat, bread and fuel. For example, in January 2018, people took the streets to protest about the removal of subsidies on wheat prices, which led to an um, increase in the prices of wheat. The protests, however, accelerated halfway December when the economic situation decreased further with, skyrocketing, with a skyrocketing inflation rate of 70%, which was then also felt by the middle class in Sudan. Perceiving that protests, however, are simply caused by economic grievances would compromise the many causes that ignited the protests in the first place. The protests melted economic grievances with demands for political change. Protesters demonstrated against a regime under which uh, large segments of the uh, population, especially the people in the conflict affected areas and women, have suffered from heavy oppression. As protests continued throughout the first months of 2019, the Sudanese government used uh, force uh, to disperse the protests, arrest and detentions of professional, professionals, journalists and other people uh, deemed a threat to the regime um, took place. Um, security forces uh, regularly use heavy force to disperse protests. Uh, we've often seen that tear gas, uh, rubber bullets, sticks and tasers have been used to disperse the protesters. And last week, um, the Central Committee of the um, Sudan Doctors announced that the death toll currently uh, is at 90. That does not include the violence uh, in Khartoum uh, from the past week, so I would estimate that the death toll would now roughly amount to 98. And this does also not include uh, the amount of injuries, which is reportedly uh, has exceeded 7,000. Besides using force, <clears throat> Omar al-Bashir also tried to politically maneuver uh, through these protests by declaring a state of emergency on February 22nd. Um, he dissolved the government and appointed uh, people from the military to key positions within the new government. However, none of these tactics seem to, um, seem to counter determination of the protesters to uh, oust Omar al-Bashir. So on 11 April, following four day long sit-ins at the military headquarters in Khartoum, um, 
Oma al-Bashir was ousted from power uh, by the Transitional Military Council, which is currently headed by uh, Abdel Fattah al-Burhan. Um, the Transitional Military uh, Council dissolved the government and uh, declared a three-month state of emergency. Uh, the notorious Hemeti, who is the head of the Rapid uh, Support Forces, a Sudanese paramilitary group, um, infamous for its uh, role it has played in uh, the atrocities in Darfur, is the deputy head of the Transitional Military Council. Up until today, um, the sit-ins in front of the army headquarters in Khartoum do continue, um, and the protesters demand the handover of power to a civilian-led regime. The past week, we have seen uh, negotiations between the opposition uh, that is represented through the umbrella of uh, the Declaration of uh, Freedom and Change, which is a declaration that was signed in January by a lot of opposition parties uh, that presented their demands to the government. Uh, they have the past week negotiated with the Trans Transitional Military Council. While nothing has been finalized on paper yet, and the talks have been suspended for 72 hours, which means they will continue again on Sunday. So far, what they have agreed upon is, uh, first of all, uh, they have agreed upon uh, a transitional period of three years, uh, of which the first six months uh, will be focused on ending conflict throughout all of Sudan. The second thing they have agreed on is uh, the implementation of the establishment of a legislative council, Two-thirds of the positions within the Legislative Council will be assigned to uh, the forces under the Declaration of Freedom and Change, so the opposition forces. <coughs> and um, a joint investig investigation committee is also formed. Um, this joint investigation committee will investigate the, uh, the uh, violence used against the protesters. However, it's not uh, announced that we will be part of this committee, which of course, if uh, there are uh, people within the Transitional Military Council who have uh, are uh, accused of uh, having been, having participated in the violations against uh, protesters. So it will be important to see who will be part of this uh, committee. The last and the most contested issue that the uh, uh, Transitional Military Council and the opposition have not yet agreed upon is the establishment of the Sovereign Council. The Sovereign Council is an authority that will guide the three-year uh, interim period, the transition period, um, but they haven't agreed upon yet who will uh, participate in the Sovereign Council, whether it will be the opposition force or the military. And sources close to the negotiators have said that there are elements within the military that would not accept the negotiated agreements when uh, civilians would participate in the Sovereign Council. So we're currently facing um, a very fragile situation um, where no finalized agreement has been put on paper and the talks will continue on Sunday. And of course, this is um, all happening in the uh, context of a very volatile situation on the streets as well with the protesters uh, and some use of violence and reports of deaths uh, um, uh, of protesters. So how does that uh, how is that playing out and um, how is that affecting the political process uh, being undertaken? Um, I, I think that was uh, uh, my colleague Andrew was going to reply to that question. Yes, but, but uh, <laughs> can, you, can you update us on the, on the protests uh, on the streets, well, um, reports of, oh, of, yeah, of yeah. deaths and... Yes, yeah, so what, as I said, um, uh, what we've seen on the streets is that uh, there's, there, there are always two different numbers reported on uh, the amount of uh, fatalities. Um, so <coughs> the Sudan Doctors uh, Committee, which is also an opposition party, they have said last week that 90 people so far have died. Um, the committee has, throughout the protest, uh, delivered reports of, um, uh, of the fatalities and injuries. The government, however, uh, reported at the end of April that 56 people have died, which is a difference of 32. However, the numbers of the uh, Sudan Doctors Committee were published one week after the uh, government published their numbers. Um, with regards to detention of journalists, uh, we also have seen um, uh, detentions throughout the protest. Um, the last number that was reported was actually halfway February, so it's reportedly more, it's probably much higher right now. Uh, 79 journalists have been uh, detained throughout the protest and many local uh, newspapers have been banned. Thank you.
Um, Andrew, the um, as as we as we were discussing earlier, the the protest movement, uh, both the protest movement and the transitional military council seem to be uh, beset by different factions, internal struggles, uh, and specifically the the opposition movement that led to the the protests, and uh, it's composed of political parties of. Uh, uh, professional associations. So, um, how are these internal tensions playing out, and uh, what what is the prospect for coming, let's say, for coming months in terms of the stability of this of this process? Uh, well, it's important to say that um, originally, if you had said a week ago that this sort of balance of power was definitely more in the protesters' hands, this week, particularly on Monday. Um, given the recent attacks and the sort of uh, call off of the, the agreement uh, to the agreed by the military transition and military council, it seems that they seem to be having more of the power now. So it seems like the balance of power is more on their hands um, at the current moment. Um, that might change, we don't know, but that's the current situation as it is, as it stands. Um, particularly because of the attacks that took place on Monday, as I said, uh, but also because uh, the, the transition and military council is also. Uh, uh, pretty much so that they would pose a threat uh, or call out for elections, uh, which they can do constitutionally because they're allowed to. Um, but that uh, would also impact the dynamics that we see on the ground in Sudan as well. Um, I just want to quickly uh, demonstrate. So this is sort of uh, data from the archive database, which actually illustrates the number of uh, violent incidents and armed clashes throughout 2018 to up to date. And so what you see, particularly with the protest stuff, it's in certain areas where the protests uh, have taken place. Uh, if we the next one, if you... If you zoom into the actual cartoon the city itself, you can see that the protests and where violence is taking place is in the same sort of area again as well. And sorry, just the last one, which is the civilian, so the actual uh, civilian unrest as well. So when it comes to protests, what we see is a pattern, if you overlay the two, that actually a lot of the protests had taken place before the start of uh, 2000, uh, so the end of 2018. A lot of these protests that you see now um, actually occurred much earlier in the year, uh, but it's only obviously into 2008, December 2018, where things started to really intensify. But protests had been taking place. When you overlap the protests with uh, the armed violence, what you see is that there is still, uh, I would say, definitely a difference between the way in which violence is used in Khartoum than it is uh, in, um, in in places like Darfur. So there is a difference in the way in which the operations are being, uh, or sort of protests are being dealt with uh, during that period. Of And what are the yellow dots? The yellow dots uh, relate to the number of civ uh, civilian unrest um, and the red of the armed clashes. Sorry, uh, number of armed clashes and the red of the protests. Sorry. So what you see is throughout 2018, even to current date, there is a lot of activity going taking place in the Gulf War area. Um, and that is a concern because actually uh, uh, this current agreement that you see or that people are talking about um, doesn't actually have the mechanisms or hasn't really involved a lot of the armed groups who would have formed because of the, these isolations. And so I think one of the larger concerns that I have is even though the alliance and the transitional military council are coming to agreement, even though there are fragmentations within the transitional military council and within uh, the actual uh, alliance, uh, there isn't an inclusive approach that has been taken that includes a lot of these rebel groups who form for the very same um, reason. So what I what I what we see happening is it's more the elites and the military mostly negotiating with each other as opposed to the rebel groups that are outside that a lot of these groups form for this very reason as well. Thank you. Um, uh, Nina, the economics of this crisis or this uh, current situation is, uh, they're quite important because as we have seen before in the Arab Spring, the uh, prices, inflation, food prices, fuel prices, they have also 
played an important role in this. So, um, can you go through the some of the economic dimension of this um, of the situation? Certainly, yeah, the economics are very important to discuss because the spark that ignited these protests, the, well, the acceleration of the protests in December was the tripling of bread prices from one to three Sudanese pounds. Uh, this was already following a year of drastic economic inflation. Long lines for bread, cash, and fuel were not uncommon sights throughout all of uh, Sudan. Since the uh, secession of South Sudan in 2011, Sudan has lost about 70% um, of its oil production, which was the main export product for Sudan. Um, while South Sudan would still depend on Sudan for the transport of oil, um, was yeah, was uh, South Sudan would still depend on Sudan for the transport of oil. Um, the ongoing civil war in South Sudan has um, decreased the oil production and thus the incomes that Sudan could draw from the transportation of oil. Um, the declining economic situation was felt among all segments of the population that increasingly started to express a discontent with, uh, with the regime and its policies. The um, uh, declining economic situation also diminished al Bashir's possibilities to actually co opt rival elites uh, through state resources. Besides South Sudan's uh, secession, um, the country has furthermore suffered from the um, uh, sanctions imposed by uh, the US in 1997. Even though they were lifted in 2017 by Donald Trump, the sanctions have not brought the um, hope for success. Um, so the economic situation in Sudan needs to be addressed before the country can get back on track. The new government will be faced with challenges of st stabilizing the economy, and depending on whether the transitional forces will be predominantly civilian or military, there are two strategies with regards to their external economic relations that the new government may follow to rehabilitate uh, the country's economy. The first part, which is likely to occur when the, uh, transnational, uh, the transitional uh, military council remains in power, will be a continuation of Bashir's strategy um, characterized by international rehabilitation and increased cooperation with um, uh, regional partners such as Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. Um, these countries have already expressed their support for the Transitional Military Council, uh, perhaps related to their interest in maintaining the Transnational Military Council in power. Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates um, have demonstrated their support through the donation right after the ousting of al-Bashir. Both countries pledged $3 billion uh, uh, to Sudan, uh, which was pretty much a lifeline for the Transnational Military Council. I think there are two main reasons uh, why Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates have an interest in ensuring that the Transnational Military Council remains in power. Well, first of all, the regional stability. Um, the um, regional support for the transitional, transitional Military Council can be seen as a move to curb the threat of regional instability and the possibility of a power takeover by parties uh, affiliated to the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, Egypt, by the way, particularly could fear a spillover effect of the protests in case of a civilian takeover, given that the country is, uh, Egypt is ruled itself by a um, by Sisi, who came to, to power through a military coup, and the country's economy over the past few years has also declined significantly. Secondly, maintaining the influence of the Transitional Military Council and the Sudanese government will also serve Saudi Arabia's agenda in the war in Yemen, where the record support forces, who are part of the Transitional Military Council, currently um, fight the Houthi rebels. Um, so yeah, the Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates uh, just have a vested interest in ensuring that the Transitional Military Council will stay in power. The second scenario, in case a civilian government takes over, we may not see the same support of Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. Um, so we might expect that um, Sudan will start looking for um, the civilian government will start looking for other uh, economic partners abroad. Um, it could, for example, focus on increasing ties with the European Union and the US, because both uh, countries, well, the European, all the countries in the EU and the US, have expressed their support for the transition to a civilian, for a civilian-led transition. Um, the civilian-led government will hopefully receive more sympathy uh, from Western countries than the Bashir regime did, uh, which they could perhaps use to um, increase their economic co cooperation and implement. Um, 
debt relief measurements. However, the EU and US are not able of the fast cash, de cash, de ca the fast cash delivery that the Gulf states are able to deliver. I expect they will focus more on the engagement of these countries with Sudan will focus more on economic reforms and institutional support. Thank you. Um, Andrew, the, uh, the situation since the, um, the ouster of al-Bashir seems to um, have placed more power, more influence on the military. Um, but of course, this, um, the, the protests and the way that the, the, the relationship to the Transitional Military Council have changed as well. So if you could tell us who are the key actors that we should be looking for uh, um, in Sudan for the, for the for the way forward, obviously the military, but but also in the you know the protest side side of things and, and other actors. Um, well, I, I would I would probably leave it to one key actor, um, and that's just purely because of the way things are being run. Um, uh, Nina's mentioned his name, uh, Himiti, and I think he is uh, the main person to look out for. He is ambitious. He is young. Um, he uh, was part of the formation of the RSF. Um, in particular, he has a drive, and he has been bought out by uh, various other groups in the past, uh, and he, he wants power, that's very clear. Uh, he, that's why he's second in command. Um, there is no doubt in my mind that if uh, the sort of attacks that you saw on Monday were instigated as a way of trying to show that actually the RSF still has power, uh, particularly within Khartoum, uh, different, uh, you still see sort of the attacks that are taking place outside of Khartoum as well. Uh, by the RSF, uh, but again, it's uh, because of that, I think his determination, uh, foreign leaders have met him, not foreign leaders, sorry, foreign dip, uh, diplomats have met him as well, and I think that pattern is what you're going to see going forward. Uh, he, uh, unfortunately, has the number of troops in, in Khartoum as well, which is the capital, which is the center of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the country, so uh, he's, he's the key actor for me uh, going forward. Thanks. Uh, the, um, we went through a little bit of the international implications of this and uh, the economic, especially the economic partners and potential partners. Um, about the political influence that some of these international actors are having on the ground, uh, we see a lot of interest from neighboring countries, um, especially Arab countries. Um, so what impact are they having on this very delicate political transition? And what should um, institutions, especially regional institutions such as the African Union, be doing to help that, or are doing to, to, to help that? Well, one of the things I would uh, I would caution about the well, caution the international community, and I know I've got, we've got some diplomats in the room, um, is the sort of rush uh, to I would say try and get involved and uh, and good winning, and I think that's uh, that might be a mistake in this case, uh, particularly because. We're seeing a, a transition away from sort of the war on terror to sort of the sort of great powers where you have China, Russia, and the US all sort of uh, running for this, the Horn of Africa. Particularly, you've also got the, the Middle East countries also trying to build military bases there as well. This doesn't help the dynamics of what's taking place in the region. And so, I'm I'm mindful that if you you know if, if the international community just rushes into it with this sort of unclear strategy, it, what it does is it causes problems on the ground. So what you see is further fragmentation of groups, uh, people being bought out, uh, militia groups form, uh, forming because of this sort of competition. And so and so for me, uh, the caution would be, or the thing would be actually the international community should play, uh, should, will play a minimal role. And if, if it's going to play any role, there should be more synergy between what it does in Sudan, uh, particularly, as I said, because the sort of geopolitics that are taking place, particularly where we, we see it focus more on less on war on terror and this focus on sort of the great powers, uh, China, Russia and uh, the US. Uh, so that's one of the things I, I would uh, be careful of. Um, the other thing I would also uh, be mindful of is the African Union. I think it has a role to play, it could have played a role, but I think in the eyes of Sudanese now, particularly because it gave the 15 day sort of uh, warning and then uh, the African Union Chair, uh, who's uh, the Egyptian President Sisi, then reversed it and actually gave him a uh, three-month extension. That doesn't play well with Sudanese. And so I think the trust uh, with everyday Sudanese, is, the trust issue is going to be there, uh, a worry for them going forward. I think the African Union could have played a role there, particularly if you remember the uh, 2008 elections in Kenya, for example, trying to mediate and bring in uh, international partners like Kofi Annan at the time to sort of negotiate the deal, a uh, transitional government. That would have been the role, but again, because of their sort of 
we're going to have 15 days, we give you 15 days and then we reverse it and give you three months. I think that's, uh, that legitimacy might be lost within the eyes of the, uh, the people. The other thing just to note is uh, IGAD. So IGAD is a, or well, EGAD is the sort of regional part, uh, partner and uh, it's weak, we know, it has, it has problems, uh, everyone knows about South Sudan. Um, one of the things that I'm, I'm mindful of is, is sort of the international community rushing and saying, let's go for call for elections. So that is very dangerous. And uh, some, some of our preliminary data, which I will show you here, uh, that we're going to be able to report, what it actually shows is when it comes to uh, elections in, in the region, I had actually scores the worst. Uh, if, you, if you see it right, I'm going to see one. The, the one I'm blocking. And so what, what what you see is actually when it comes to the number of presidential elections, it actually has less. Um, legislative, it ranks lowest. Uh, the change of presidency, it ranks the lowest. And the shift of political majority within parties, it actually ranks the lowest. And this is a, so we're putting this report together on the next few months. Uh, but again, calling for elections for me doesn't make sense because the institution or IGAD, it's, or EGAD, IGAD, as you want to call it, actually won't be able to support uh, the government uh, or support Sudan. So actually, it doesn't make sense because you're just going to end up with the, the, the same status quo again. Uh, and so for me, uh, IGAD's role will be minimal because it doesn't have systems like other institutions like ECOWAS, for example. And so uh, for me, I, I, I would, what I'd rather see is if there is going to be a role for the international community and regional partners, that they work in synergy together, and that it's, it is either a African Union or stroke UN led mediation that takes the parties together and brings them all together in sort of in a transitional period to sort of think about what they want, how it's going to work, how it's going to be implemented, how they bring everyone around the table and to come up with a, a agreed negotiation that helps everybody. Um, at the moment, I'm not seeing that. One method that sometimes and oftentimes helps in understanding uh, conflict is by coming up with uh, scenarios and uh, trying to analyze how they would play out. So I know that you, you, you have some ideas of scenarios. Can you run through them uh, with us, like potential scenarios, let's say, for coming years, uh, coming out of this, of this political yeah. crisis? And so I, I, I think there were, I mentioned it earlier about sort of Kenya, uh, model, and I think there are sort of four models that could, or uh, well, Sudan could end up uh, going down past that if you go down. I think one, it could end up with the Ethiopian model, what you see currently now, uh, that would require it to have a very strong performance leader, uh, but that would be a continuation of the same system. So even though uh, President Abiy has done really well and has, you know, uh, is a reformist, is very radical in his reforms, actually the, the state structure itself remains the same. And so that's why you've seen a lot of the internal uh, sort of communal violence uh, uprisings uh, more recently. So yes, that is a model, but it would, it would have implications uh, for Sudan, particularly as I showed uh, you earlier, uh, Darfurians, uh, or the, uh, sorry, the groups in Darfur uh, that haven't been brought to the table and in the South as well haven't been brought to the table. So that, uh, to me, is a, a worry. Uh, the, the second model, I, I would say, or path, would be the Egyptian model, where again you have more of the same. You have a, a sort of a, a dictator leader who comes in, and that would be a Hamidity's uh, role, where he comes in, stays in power, uh, changes the constitution, makes small reforms, uh, but ends up staying in for a decade, two decades, three decades, um, and that is probably more likely now. Uh, I would say in Sudan, uh, particularly because uh, even if the transitional military council and the alliance come to some sort of form of agreement, actually it's how they figure out the differences within the group. So not just within the security apparatus, but also within uh, the lines. There are differences between the political parties, there are differences between uh, the actual mini transitional military council and within the security apparatus and how you deal with that. None of them have actually been able to do that. But I think another thing is they've not actually put forward a proposal which is, I would say, a secular reform proposal which uh, includes everybody. It still has, uh, some Islamic uh, sort of uh, elements, uh, which for some people's eyes it might be too radical, to an ordinary Sudanese, it's not what they want. Uh, the third sort of model I think is pretty much everything breaks down, uh, <coughs> chaos, internal uh, conflict. Uh, you see that in sort of the Libya, where we are now with Libya, uh, you sort of have the international community meddling and trying to get somewhere but actually doesn't work, and just, you just have 
country just breaks down. Uh, and then the fourth model, as I said, was the sort of Kenya 2008 model, where you actually have a mediated team go in, try to support a transitional period, and try and get these guys to negotiate. But again, I want to caution against the rush to elections. Um, elections, yes, are good, but in the case of this region, in the case of what we have seen, it won't support a democratic transition. It, what it will do is hamper the situation. Thanks. I will open for questions now. Um, I have one on my own, but if you if you have questions, please raise your hands and I will um, call upon you. But um, to start with, I would like to ask um, either of you or both of you, um, as, as you know, the issue of urbanization is one that we follow quite closely here, and we, uh, as Nina mentioned, some of the um, issues like food prices, um, um, inflation in general, um, have played out as an important factor in the, in the lead up to the protests. Um, we've also seen in sub-Saharan Africa in general the, the trend of a rising middle class, at least uh, many analysis pointed that way in, in previous years. How have these uh, demographic factors affected the, the protests? Because we've seen that um, there were quite a few protests in, in, in urban areas, uh, the middle classes in, in Sudan, even though they are, they are limited uh, in comparison to other countries, have also been important factors, uh, professionals, doctors, etc. Um, has there been this, this rise of the middle class affecting the, the lead up to protests in Sudan? Was this a factor at all? Um, what do you think? To me, isn't it? I, I look well, at you, but... to me. Okay, so, okay. I mean, for, for me, I would say it definitely has. I think the difference between uh, these protests now and what you saw before in uh, uh, previous times is that actually, uh, as I said, you, the marginalization of people in, in, the, uh, in sort of outside parts of, of, of uh, Sudan has taken place for many years, decades. Uh, but what you saw now was those the impact, uh, particularly from a generation of people who lived under Bashir for, for decades, with so many of those policies who were impacted by it, uh, not just financially, but a lot of them who were young professionals who, you know, trained educated abroad, come back to give back into Sudan, but actually just were fed up, were tired of what was going on. Um, I, I think I think that's why you see that change. I, I, if not, I think you would have seen more of the same, uh, particularly as I showed you on the data points. Uh, protests were taking place earlier on in 2018, uh, but it was still dealt with with sort of harsh uh, policies. It's only into really in December where it started to impact those at the centre, particularly those who again were professionals, young doctors, uh, uh, pharmacists, uh, people I would say to a degree close to the regime, uh, close close enough, uh, probably hand uh, hand length, that actually when it impacted them, that's when you see this sort of rise up. Um, Yes, there has been solidarity with everyone uh, from the war to uh, the south to come in together and work. But I think, again, because of the impact on the centre, I think that's why you see the protests taking place. Um, I would like to add to that as well that um, what we've seen during these protests was as well uh, these professionals associating themselves and the unions and the associations. For example, the Sudanese Professionals Organization which is an, again an umbrella organization of several uh, unions, um, of doctors, teachers, lawyers, etc. They have been really the driving force of these protests. Like every, um, almost every Thursday, we saw that the SBA organized a march again or a, or a protest. Um, so I think that the, the role that, that uh, like uh, these professionals organizing in unions and associations that that, the, the, that that played is also significantly different from uh, protests that we've seen earlier uh, this decade. Just to also add as well, the, the other thing is uh, what is different as well, I would say in my eyes, is that actually this time around uh, the the political sort of opposition parties were late to the sort of party, if you want to put it that way. Uh, most of them didn't really join into February, March, where the protests, as I said, were really at its peak, or started to increase more, mostly around December, but even before that, uh, a lot of the political parties were quiet. They weren't really supporting the protest. Um, even within the current agreement now, we see the Communist Party sort of pulling out saying, actually, we don't agree with this, or the Uma Party saying, we don't agree with that part. It's actually this this whole entire thing has been people-led. Uh, but as Nina said, it's it's mostly the young people, young professionals, who have been the driving force mm -hmm. for this as well. Anyone has any questions at this moment? 
Um, you, um, sir, gentleman over there, then, then I'll go to, to other questions, please. Okay. And, uh, if you could identify yourselves first, please. Oh, sorry. My name is Jihad Mashamon, and I'm a doctoral researcher at the Institute of Urban Studies at the University of Ecuador, and I'm from Sudan. I was actually wondering, uh, it might be split between two questions, if it's all right. The first one is related to Hameti being given power as president, because I know for, for, I know that the military do not see eye to eye with the RSF, especially the junior officers. How likely is that the military would actually take power instead of Hameti? If I may ask that question. Ah, do you want to ask the second one or do you want me to answer? It's right there. Yeah, that's fine. The second one is regarding geopolitical interest. Is it possible that we can look at it from uh, another side of the coin? That yes, they're trying to uh, Saudi Arabia and Emirates and Egypt now wants Islamists to uh, take over in Sudan and another Islamic general. What about if the civil uh, civil society leaders of the SPLA and civil uh, civilian government comes in and they provide those interests? I mean, at the end, Sudanese don't want another Islamist themselves. Can that be looked at? Uh, can that also be seen from an American perspective and regional perspective? Okay, so we have two questions, one for each. So I'll I'll, I'll go to you now, and, and then we'll so go back to I, I the reason why I. I, I, I feel that MD, MD will have more power than um, the SFA is partly because the FSA itself is divided. Um, and what, what I mean divided is in the sense that the sort of the, the generals themselves, the high ranking levels, see it very differently from sort of lower class, um, sort of lower and middle ranks uh, soldiers. And so that, that separation, I think, is causing problems within the military itself. If you take that element, and you take the RSF and how united they are, mm -hmm. then for me, that is a stronger force at the moment, particularly because if you look at where they're placed, they're mostly placed in Khartoum at the center. And so for me, that is, it's not necessarily that the, the SFA aren't strong. Yes, they probably have more troops and they do have more troops, yeah. but actually where they're located and where the center of power is, for me, it's at the center of Khartoum and that's where the RSF are. And so for me, that is what I would say is why it's a concern, but that's mm -hmm. why I also feel he, is a dominant person, and also he's number two. He is number two. He's the one meeting diplomats. He has support from uh, the what's it called the, from uh, the Saudis, uh, and so that support. He's always had that support, but that support in particular, I think, is 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 the way people will see it as something legitimate. Uh, maybe not in our eyes, but particularly for the regional partners, they see actually he he is the, we can work with him. We have worked with him in the past. Uh, we know how he operates. We know if we give him cash, he's on our side. It works for us. And so I think that same pattern is what they're looking for. Uh, I don't think that you're going to get that when it comes to, uh, you know, the, the generals, particularly because a lot of them, again, that's, they disagree or the lower ranks, they don't seem to have control of what's going on between the lower and middle ranks. Mm -hmm. Thank you, um, To address your second question, indeed, I think uh, that's a very good point you raise. I also, um, from yeah, what I've been uh, monitoring, I also don't think that there's actually a lot of momentum for a Muslim Brotherhood affiliated party to take over again in Sudan. Mm -hmm. However, I think that fair for Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates also, and Egypt also partly lays in the fact that if uh, a civilian uh, government will take over, it actually signals that protests can be successful and maybe the implications that will have for internal stability in uh, Egypt or in uh, Saudi Arabia itself. So it's also about um, uh, yeah, what it actually signals if uh, a civilian transition is successful, if protests are successful. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry, you... Yeah. <laughs> Both of you, but... but. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Jill Lusk, and I'm a journalist specialising in Sudan. Um, one small comment first. If Himeti took power, there would, I think stability would not be the word, because Darfur would never, ever accept Himeti in power. He was the leader of the Janjaweed, you know, that committed the genocide for which President, ex-President Omar is, is wanted um, by the International Criminal Court. But my question is more on the nature of the regime, which has supposedly been overthrown. Um, Sudanese are very concerned about what they're calling the deep state, quite rightly calling the deep state, because uh, that was a regime that was there for 30 years, an Islamist regime, obviously involved in many large international terrorist um, atta attacks, as well as all the attacks at home. 
So um, it created a very complex state, dependent on largely more on the more on the intelligence services than the mm -hmm. army. How can that be dismantled? Thank you, ma'am. Would you like to? Yes, you <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm Rosalind Marsden from uh, Chatham House. Um, I just had a question about um, the comment you made, Andrew. I think that the international community should play a minimal role. Um, I would certainly agree that forces of freedom and change have made, made very clear that they certainly didn't want the African Union or indeed any international actors intervening to try and mediate with the, with the military council. Um, they wanted basically because they were saying we're negotiating on the street, this is our main leverage, and we don't want you coming in and sort of freezing that process. Uh, I also agree that um, it would be wrong for the international community to press for early elections, and of course now I think there was earlier this week there was an agreement on the transitional period of three years and I hope the international actors now understand why it would be a mistake to try and press for anything earlier than that. But on the other hand, I think continued international pressure is very important because at the moment we, I think we see the Western actors pressing hard that the negotiations need to resume promptly, the 72-hour suspension shouldn't continue, that um, there should be absolutely no violence used against peaceful protesters, there should be an inquiry to work out what who was responsible for the violence on Monday and Wednesday evenings, and also the fact that I think both the EU and the US have made clear there will be no economic assistance until there's a civilian-led government. That, that uh, message has been delivered quite strongly. So I think that sort of pressure is valuable, um, particularly because of the need to counter some of the support, the political signals coming in the other direction from Saudi Arabia and its allies. And then finally, I think one thing the international community could very usefully do is to go after the illicit uh, assets of the Bashir regime in a number of ways that have been suggested by you know, the Century Project. So I think you know, that would help to undermine the deep state and make it less likely that the, the sort of, um, the, basically the old regime parties will just come back through the ballot box in three years' time and gains of the revolution will be lost. Thank you. If I remember, Rosalind's actually understating her, her. Would you like to just say your, because I know we used to work in Sudan as well. Do you just want to add your, your role before? Sorry, she's actually understating her, what she's done before. So. Oh, sorry. I You've been put on, on yeah, spot. Yeah. So, uh. <laughs> yeah. I was the ambassador, British ambassador in Khartoum um, from 2007 to 10, and then the European Union special envoy. And, and just, if I, well, as I've got the floor, one final point. <laughs> just on the point you made about the political parties. Now, I, I've worked a lot with the opposition parties, and I would agree that, you know, they are unfortunately prone to a lot of internal uh, rivalries and continued divisions. But, and, and we also, I think, know that al Sadiq al-Mahdi was rather slow in cuts in coming out in support of the, of the street protests. But I think one has to remember that on the 1st of January, the Sudan called the largest opposition alliance and the national consensus forces with the Communist Party and the Unionist Alliance did all sign up to the declaration of the forces for freedom and change. And, and quite a few of the professionals on the streets are also actually members of the Uma Party and so forth. So I think while being rightly critical of some of what they've been doing, I think they are trying hard to sort of to unify for the purposes of putting maximum pressure on the military council. And they do basically have bottom line strategic objectives that they all agree to. If I remember correctly, we had a full row of questions. So, sir. Uh, yeah, I'm another, the yeah, Kent, another former British ambassador. <laughs> 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 Sorry, we had enough. <laughs> can I just pick up on um, Andrew's point about the Western actors being involved? Because I think it's rather important about the movements in Darfur uh, and South called a fan and the way that they haven't been integrated into this, this process. And of course, as Jill has said, uh, the movements uh, in Darfur would find a Hermeti-led government, which would, they would see as a sort of Janjaweed-led government, uh, as, as pretty uh, unacceptable. Um, uh, can I just ask the, 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 the panel, I mean, how do you see these armed movements, uh, which are very split themselves, being incorporated into the process. I think it's true to say that the kind of half agreement that's been reached between the TMC uh, and the Forces for Change uh, does mention the importance of, of dealing with the, the conflicts uh, in uh, Darfur and, and South Kordofan, but uh, uh, particularly as 
with your speciality uh, with um, uh, the security aspects. How would you see as the, the best way of, of incorporating the Sudan Liberation Movement, the SPLM, North, and, and so on? I, I think it's about uh, this, uh, negotiations and talks. So I think what needs to happen is whether you say it, it's a sort of a technocratic uh, leadership that takes over, you know, or runs Sudan for now, and in the, in the background of that, you actually have all of these groups sit down and talk and negotiate and have some sort of uh, I don't know, three months, six months of negotiations on what the future of Sudan would look like. I think that is what's key. At the moment, as I said, my, my biggest concern is everyone at the centre is having a discussion, but actually there isn't a dialogue with everybody in the sense of the groups outside, as you, as you said, and as I said earlier, and bringing them to the table to say, actually, what do you want? How do you see Sudan? And that, to me, is what is key. There isn't a sort of, there is a plan from the alliance, but actually it's not a plan that includes all of the groups to say, actually, we sat down at the table with the agree that this is what we want, this is the model for Sudan going forward. Uh, so we have a transitional period. What is it, how do we, uh, how do we govern that, that period? How do we govern uh, the, the sovereignty, uh, sorry, the, the sovereign council? How do we govern the defense and the security council uh, during that period? All of those discussions, all of those uh, sort of negotiations need to have taken place and that hasn't happened. And so my concern is even if we got to agreement next week, uh, things are formed, it's, you know, we have a transitional period of three years, you still have left out the fundamental groups and then you, you're back there at the same place again. And so for me, that's why I highlighted it. There is a difference between those who joined, I think, to a degree, because it has been elite focused uh, and it hasn't really done enough to, um, to incorporate the outside groups. Um, on uh, Himiti, sorry, uh, I, one thing to say is that I'm not saying that he should be president or he should be in charge. That's not what I'm saying. Uh, so just to clarify that. But I, I do feel that, that the power balance is in his favour, particularly because he has, re I mean, if you've looked at anything on, on Twitter or, or on social media, he's rebranding himself and he's doing it really well. He's going around to hospitals, he's meeting protesters who've been wounded, he's doing press statements. And this is a different way, it's, it's still using the same system. But he's rebranded himself in a way that actually he's seen as sort of the, the liberator, the supporter of protesters, which we know traditionally hasn't been the case. And so, yes, I don't agree that he should be, but the way in which things are going, uh, he might end up being. It's, it's high rightly because, again, the, to me, uh, particularly the military are divided. And so, if not, if you don't have some sort of strong leader to control the security apparatus, then the whole thing just crumbles, it breaks down. And then you end up with sort of a Libya model where everything just is chaotic, uh, militias forming, people doing what they want to do, which is not what we want. Um, Rod Rosden's point on the sort of international community, yes, I, I do feel they have a role to play. Um, but I, I just I just worry that if the international community goes so hard on this, um, as we've seen in the past, um, you end up, like I said, with a Libya model, or in the worst case, even South Sudan, where people just don't, do what they're supposed to do, and then you have a, another revitalized police agreement, another one, and nobody actually uh, holds uh, holds these parties to, uh, to to account. So I think international community has a role to play. For me, it has to be has to have more synergy. It has to be minimal. I think international community must be putting more pressure on the regional partners because I think that's where uh, that's really what is driving what's going on in Sudan to the degree, not necessarily fully, but particularly on the security side. Um, and I think that in that side of engagement is where I probably see would like to see more uh, sort of uh, discussion taking place between the international community, as in the UK, US, trade uh, countries, and um, uh, Sudan's uh, transitional Ministry council. Any uh, aspect that you would like to address? No, yeah, I fully uh, would agree with uh, Andrew's analysis of the situation. I think what will be particular interesting to look out for is how, um, in case that, uh, in case when the armed groups are going to be uh, invited to the negotiation table, what the uh, SPLM faction uh, by um, uh, uh, AW will do and the SPLM Nord faction headed by Aliyu, because that are the two armed groups that have not signed the uh, declaration of. Uh, change and freedom, while uh, the other armed groups have. And so I think it will be particularly interesting to see how we are going to convince them to get to the negotiation table. <coughs> oh, thank you. My name is Ahlam Akram. I am from Basira for Universal Women's Rights. Uh, to be honest with you, I follow the 
what you're saying, and I follow Islamists rising up or hopefully going down. But my main concern in these cold revolutions are women and women's mm. rights in particular. And connecting this with international community, I believe, and I hope you agree with that, that uh, changes for women, you know, uh, will be the only way for security, future security as well as, so I wouldn't mind community, uh, international community pressure on any government in that region to create that change and especially taking into consideration what's happening in Saudi Arabia now, although it's not clear yet, but the latest thing where one of the biggest scholars, religious scholars, call themselves scholars, uh, have came out publicly to repent about his uh, propagating radicalization and all of this and asking for forgiveness and repentance, which so it, it, uh, I am sure you will, I mean, international community will earn more credibility within societies if it takes such approach, which is justice and equality for women, is the, the basis for change, societal change, and the infrastructure of a peace culture, of a change, which is going to take a long time. And, and I am in two minds when you talk about uh, uh, having a regime similar to Egyptian one, uh, yes, I can see the violations of, he, of rights in Egypt, uh, you know, from the uh, existing regime, but at the same time, knowing the mentality and being raised up in that part of the world, I can see most unfortunate that there must be a transitional period for the people to create that change. And women are the key, in my view. I wonder if you should light, could you know, put light on it. Yes, I wouldn't ignore at all, indeed, uh, the very important role of including women in both the negotiations, but also in the in government that will be established uh, after. It's not only negotiations. You see, I don't, I don't look for just political participations uh, as bear one, three, two, five. Women in that part of the world, they need support much more than just giving her a job. They need support through society and through the legal system over there that undermine their position and they put them under injustices and inequalities. So the pressure should be on the governments to, to, create, to create that necessary change in their legal system that is based on interpretations of God knows how many thousand years ago. Okay. So this um, is, I don't know if I would talk. So, so, so if, I, if I can uh, try to summarize this, um, what can be done perhaps by the international community um, uh, to to, to try to steer that in that direction, what are the challenges that are currently in place? And uh, I, as I understand, Andrew, you, you also raised awareness to in, in some of the pieces you wrote on the role of women uh, in the protest movement. Um, so, you know, if you, if you could share any thoughts you have on, on these issues, and then I'll turn to Andrew. Well, first of all, I think, yeah, what you say is, uh, is correct on, on the importance of it. And I think there's also good momentum for it because uh, women have really been at the forefront of the protest in Sudan. Like that was so beautifully uh, visualized by the picture of um, Ala Salah, what's her name? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Excuse me for my pronunciation. Who was in the, in the white gown and the golden earrings chanting on, on top of that car. She was a 22 year old uh, architecture student. Um, so women really have been at the forefront of these uh, protests. So I think there's great momentum. With regards to the role of the international community, I would really like to uh, <laughs> <laughs> to pass that one on to Andrew. Well done. I, I mean, I, I think the international community has a role to play, but I go back to the the, the, the the argument I made earlier, which is if you don't change the structural system of Sudan, if you don't change um, the mechanisms of how it works, then you just repeat the same thing. So there is. It, it's it's typical of sort of the 19 sort of you know you had the whole sort of international human rights law everyone should sign and ratify and that means that a country is more let's say more peaceful and, and whatnot but actually if the system itself isn't dismantled if the system itself doesn't include women then it makes no difference how much uh, you know you shout because I mean you have the same issue in Saudi Arabia where the international has said time and time again you should try and reform you should include women they should be able to drive 
it, it makes no difference, the structure itself. And so what I would say, uh, as I said earlier, is if women are not included as part of this process, then it makes no difference. We saw the young lady that uh, Nines mentioned, but since then, where, ha where has she been? Is she at the negotiation table? Are women groups part of the negotiation? Are they structuring? Are they having to say about what the structure of Sudan should look like? They're not. And so, again, my concern is even if we, 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 we get a negotiation tomorrow, it's the same thing that's going to happen again. Because actually, you haven't brought everyone to the table to say, what do we want Sudan to look like for the future? And so, yes, the international community can play a role. But again, it has to work really within Sudan, but also yeah. within the region itself. If you look at the region, as I said, uh, what I showed you, uh, uh, the sort of data that we've, we've been collecting, um, you don't see that pattern. You see actually that region itself is suffering. And so even if we said, okay, you know, uh, let's say, for example, Ethiopia is a reformist country and it's moving forward. If all of the partners in all the countries in that region don't do the same, it makes no difference. Because actually the pattern won't change. That's what's got to happen. It's got to come from the people, it's got to come from the structure needs to be dismantled, and or everybody needs to be part of it. And that's what's not happened. So for me, yes, inter international community can play a role, but it's one of the regional, I think, is definitely something that needs to be focused on. That is done by strengthening I, 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 what we get. The second thing is that uh, the sort of localized uh, institutional structures that exist in Sudan need to be dismantled. If not, We'll be having the same conversation again, and you, you know, me and you agree with this. <laughs> Money. Yes. I think we have time for one more question. If anyone, sir. Hello, I'm, I'm Nick from the MID. Uh, I'm interested in your opinions on implications for wider regional security and mm -hmm. stability, or stability, particularly in regards to the South Sudanese peace process. Very important question. Who would right. like to start? Um, so, um, yes, Sudan has been one of the main backers of the peace agreement in South Sudan, um, given the, the recent, uh, yeah, the, the implementation of the peace agreement has not been on schedule. Um, so I think with regards to that, because Sudan has now its own internal uh, struggles to, 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 to handle, it won't uh, look that much anymore at South Sudan and may not play the, the, the important role anymore in backing the, the peace agreement as it has done so far. Um, however, given the economic interest, of course, that Sudan still has in maintaining stability in South Sudan uh, because of the oil flow, um, I do expect uh, that they will soon turn their attention uh, back again to South Sudan and the implementation of the peace agreement there. Um, yeah, I, I sort of echo. Um, Look at Tim's. <laughs> Tim's in the room. Um, but, but I also echo what Nina said as well. Uh, I think uh, what it's telling is the, the fact that the UAE invited Saudi Kia to go to um, uh, to go to the UAE and uh, he seems to be bought to degree by them as well. I am concerned, uh, partly because I think, as I said, the peace agreement in South Sudan is a mess. Um, it's 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 a, an agreement where they monitor themselves, which doesn't really make sense uh, if, if you really think about how the previous agreement has had failed. Um, but I I wouldn't, and again, I'm not a supporter of Bashir, but I I'd like to say that one of the things that he was able to do, uh, and we obviously have in our previous briefings been able to show this from our uh, our corporate database, is that when Bashir was able to bring particularly Machar Aloni and the other generals, uh, well, to degree, uh, to the negotiation table, the, the violence levels actually dropped. And that was something that I think we uh, should undertake, uh, underscore. There, had, there is a void at the moment. Uh, Sudan isn't focused on that. That is a concern. It's a concern because actually, you know, uh, the, the agreement, if it does fall apart, who is going to hold the rebel groups uh, to account? Nobody will. I mean, Bashir had that way of, even though it sort of played against uh, what was going on in South Sudan, Bashir was able to build uh, power and over the rebel groups and bring them back into control. That's my concern right now. So if there is a clash, who is the international party or group that is able to do that? I can't see that coming from Ethiopia. So the concern is who would be able to do that next? And I, the question is, I don't know. That's the honest answer. I just don't know who played that role. Thank you. So thank you very much. This has been a very, um, very um, illustrative discussion. Um, this is part, of course, as I said, of the OnCovid database. So I encourage you to have a look online. And we also have our colleague Robert Robert Hopgood, either today or another day, uh, to give you demonstrations if you want. 
Um, and please join me in thanking our speakers.